YouTube page. Uh, it's 3.59 according to my clock, but we've got a fair amount to talk about today. So I want to go ahead and get started. Uh, the actual topic of the lecture is complexity and analysis of algorithms. But we're going to talk about Project 3 quite a while for first. Uh, then it actually at the end of the lecture, we're going to talk about Lab 11, which I just put out. I want to walk through how it's supposed to work on GL. Project 3, the first thing since I cut down on the schedule you had available to do it, you will not submit a separate design deliverable. You will not submit a separate design deliverable for Project 3. Just submit the IPython notebook when you're finished. I'll get into that later on because I understand the instructions for Project 3 don't say how to submit it yet. I'll get that out. Um, you're already done with it. Great. Just hang tight. Um, but there is no separate design document due today because I cut down on the amount of time you had to do on it. Uh, but you really should be working from a design. By this point, you should kind of know enough to know that you need to lay things out and, and design it and figure out how you're going to do it. Now, what I want to make sure I do is walk through it and uh, give you an example, uh, give you some examples of what's going on. We'll talk about this more on Wednesday. I'm not going to walk through it entirely today, but I, I'll get you started, hopefully. Uh, so as you're probably aware, Dr. Mitchell, Susan Mitchell, used to teach this section. Uh, she retired in January, which is why I moved over from teaching the majors section to teaching this section. Um, I looked at her notes, and she left me all of her files from the last three years, I think. Every semester, Project 3 in the non-major section has been figuring out how to do data analysis and data visualization, use graphics to draw charts and analyze data, because the thought is that's more relevant to non-majors than is using dictionaries to implement a family tree which is the crux of the, the majors, Project 3. Uh, in the past, Dr. Mitchell had students do use GNU plot. I mentioned that briefly. It's a uh, freely available plotting software library available that works with a number of languages. Um, and she's had students do their analysis using that one. To me, working, as you know, I, I work full time for wider court and adjunct. I teach part time at UMBC. Um, the Jupyter Notebooks, or Jupyter if you prefer, it's usually pronounced Jupyter Notebooks, and Plot9 or ggplot is much more relevant, it is much more prevalent in, in the field than is GNU plot. So I thought this would be much more relevant for you. So that is why Project 3 has you downloading and installing Jupyter Notebooks and creating a Jupyter Notebook to... Um, do some data analysis on uh, coronavirus or COVID-19 data. The data file I gave you is from is current as of last week on the number of cases, so you can do some analytics on it. Uh, so let's talk about the homework assignment for the project specifically. Um, let's make sure I've got it here. To do a repo so it doesn't show up on the first. So project three, the data file you're going to be dealing with, as I mentioned, uh, basically I downloaded Johns Hopkins University keeps a running count of the number of confirmed COVID-19 cases uh, for every country and in many cases, you know, Canadian provinces, Australian states, subdivisions of company, Chinese provinces subdivisions of countries. Uh, that's kind of a big data file that I wanted you to work with. So what I did was I just edited down and gave you a data file of the top 12 
These are the 12 countries with the most confirmed cases of COVID-19 as of April 29th, starting March 1st, uh, in order. And so this is the data you're going to analyze. It's a CSV file. The first line is your header line, which has the date in it. Uh, the first column is the country name, and everything after that is an integer value, which represents the number of confirmed COVID-19 cases uh, as of that date in that country. So on April 29th in the U.S., there was a million thirty-nine. I think we're over a million one. We might be up to a million three now. Uh, and and so on down the list to 12th place, uh, which I think is uh, officially was reported as what China was 12th uh, at 68,000 because their population of cases is officially not growing. So this is the data you're going to use and you're going to read in and process this CSV um, file. Unlike projects one and two, you're not going to have to do it the old fashioned drudge way by hand. You're going to be able to use some tools to make it easy to read in and analyze. Okay, so that's the basis of what you're doing. You're gonna read in that data file or a similar one. If I give you an updated data file, instead of April 29th, I'll give you the May 8th file, for example. Your program should work pretty much without it. It's a matter of all the tools will do that automatically that we're gonna use. Now, already I've seen, I'm, I'm trying to follow Slack several times a day and respond to questions when I get them, trying to work through them. Um, you're going to be doing this program on your own computer. If that's an issue for you, please let me know and we'll work around. The reason this actually got out so late is that I was trying to make this work on GL because Jupyter Net Notebooks should run from GL where you just have an interface, a dashboard on your screen, on your computer, and I'm having trouble making it work. So for now, you're doing this on your own computer. If you've got an issue where this is going to be a problem for you, let me know. Uh, we can work around that. Um, now, I have you installing the Py package installer for Python or PIP. Uh, it usually comes included with Python 3 releases. So if you've loaded Python 3 on your computer, 3.7 or 3.8, you may already have it. Check. A um, number of ways to check. One is just to run pip list and it'll show you what packages are installed. If that's an unrecognized command, you might not have it. Okay. If you need to install pip. Now, when you Google how to install pip, what it quite often tells you is you need to fetch a file called get-pip.py. Get-pip.py is a Python program that installs uh, a version of pip that you can upgrade to the latest version. When you follow the link, yeah, let me see if I can blow this up. When you follow the link that it gives you to get-pip.py, you get the actual, honest by gosh, Python source code. At the end, it has a bunch of binary data. This is the Python source code for PIP. Okay. What you need to do, unfortunately, this is the old fashioned way. If you need to get, get pip.py, um, what you do is you just highlight everything on this page, right click or control click on a Mac. And the menu option will come up, save as. You click save as, and you save this as get-pip.py on your computer. So yes, you will go to this ugly page, which has a Python program on it. And at the bottom of the page is a boatload of seemingly binary data, which is just the hash code um, for get pip. And if you save it on your computer, you right click or control click, save this file as get-pip.py and then run it on your computer by just saying python or python3 get-pip.py it will run and you now have pip on your computer now some of there are other ways to install things other than pip we prefer pip some of the documentation says oh we prefer you install this using conda if you prefer conda is short for anaconda keeping with the snake metaphor of python Okay, fine. If you prefer to try Conda, if you're having trouble with PIP, whatever, 
feel free. If you have questions about how to do this with Conda, that's fine. Let me know. I'll help you. Um, but for now, I'm, in su I'm assuming that you're, you have uh, PIP, the package installer for Python. Again, if you have to get the program, you will get this literally source code, save it, and then you can run it using Python. So after you have PIP installed, the next step is download and install Jupyter Notebooks on your computer. Okay. Now, I think we've been to this page before. Go there directly. Make sure you pick the right project. The Jupyter project has a number of different products. We do not want Jupyter Lab. Want the Jupyter Notebook, select install it on your computer. Okay, select install it on your computer. It will take you to this page and tell you how to do it using Conda. It'll tell you to use it PIP. That's Jupyter Lab. We don't want that. With the classic notebook, you have to have Python installed, which you should. Again, skip Conda. Use PIP. It's just PIP install notebook. Once you've done pip install notebook, you're set. All you have to do is in a command terminal, a command, uh, command window on window, command window on the Windows operating system or a terminal on Mac, you just type Jupyter space notebook. And let's see, I have two terminals running. Let's see if I can figure out how to get one. Now we'll come back to that later. Anyway, trust me for now, I brought up a terminal on my Mac and I typed Jupyter space notebook and I got this. This is what you will see. It will be in a new tab on your default browser. If you don't have tabs set up, it'll be a new window on your default browser, but it should be just a tab on your default browser and then you can start on your Jupyter Notebook. You'll come over to here. See if I can blow this up a little bit. You'll come over to here where it says new. You click new. You'll pick Python 3. And it brings you up to a new notebook. Okay. Now, I've already started a notebook called Project 3 that I'm going to use to demonstrate some things. Uh, so I will, I'll skip the step of a new one. It'll look ex almost exactly like this. I've just put a couple of cells in. The format in which Jupyter saves things is this dot IPYNB. IPYNB is the format. Um, Jupyter used to be called an IPython notebook. Little letter I following the Apple scheme, even though it's not Apple, it was IPython Notebook. And so that's why it's IPYNB. When you submit Project 3 for grading, you will submit it on GL and you will just submit the IPYNB file. Okay, that's what you'll submit. But for now, you know, once you've created it, it'll be saved and you can go back to it anytime you want to work on it for now. I'll go to my project3.ipython notebook at IPYNB, and it looks like this. Okay, and let me see if we can make it a little bit smaller to make it a little bit more legible. Now, the first cell, I'm going to switch a minute. Okay, I gave you a link to, the, to, to a good reference on how to write markdown code. If you ever wonder how web pages have HTML or Word has headings and paragraphs and italics and bold and what have you, it basically is a pattern something like this. So in Markdown, in the language of this, you're going to put your program header comment. You use a single hash or sharp or, or sharp um, or pound, whatever you want to call this symbol, to indicate I want this to be what's called a heading one, a highest level heading. So this says print 
Computer Science 201 as a heading, print Section 40, print Spring 2020, print your name, whatever it is, and print the name of your file right here. The fact that these are all indicated with the uh, hash or the shark or the pound says to Jupiter, this is Markdown, that's going to be a heading one, a top level heading. And when I, I have this one cell highlighted, so when I click run, it's going to run that cell and it's going to actually convert them into top level headings for me. Now, if I decide I don't like that heading, if I want to do something smart, something simpler, I can change it back. I will change that to. Hang on. I'm on the wrong. Sorry, I'm on the wrong cell. That's why it won't let me work. If I wanted the top level to be CMSC 201, I wanted the section number to be a smaller headline, a smaller heading your name to be a smaller. I can play around with this and decide how I like it and how I don't like it. And you can see that it changes things. So you will document, you will use these markdown cells to include a lot of the things that you will normally use for comments. You will still be commenting in your Python code, but you will use these markdown cells to provide it. The reason we do this is, you know, once you get in higher up levels and you're starting to use these Jupyter notebooks to do projects, to do term papers, to do research, whatever, this is what you're going to do. The markdown sections will have the text that you're going to use and the explanations of what you're going to do. And then the Python code cells will um, have something that you can run in real time to show the professor I've done the research and this is how this works. Okay, so that first cell is a markdown cell and I've given you a link to how to write that, the, the markdown code to give the headers and italics and formats and lists and everything else you need. Uh, if I had started this project new, you would just have this with one cell and it was blank. So if I had gone back to this one, when I said create a new Python 3, it would just give me this with one cell. So since I had already created this um, project 3, it, it, I, say, I shortcut that one. I, I've now saved this. Now, then I created another cell. I added another cell simply by clicking insert cell below and that gave me this code cell and in this code cell i'm going to import the code that i need to do the work that's assigned in this project okay plot nine p-l-o-t-n-i-n-e plot nine is the graphics library i need plot nine so that i can uh, import the graphics retreat routines and draw the bar charts and draw the multi-line charts and draw the other things needed in this project. Pandas, panel data, uh, I mentioned briefly, that is the Python module that lets you read in and deal with a CSV file all at once. So you no longer have to read in my data file, my Johns Hopkins COVID-19 data file, as a single string and convert it into a 2D list and deal with headers and columns and things like that. You no longer have to do that. Pandas includes the statement necessary to just read the whole darn file in as a single CSV file and convert it to a data frame. Data frame is a fancy name for saying 2D list. So at this point with pandas, it's gonna be a one line command to read in a data file and convert it to a 2D list, okay? Now at this point, I know a number of you, and I apologize, I'm trying to work through this with you. A number of you have not been able to get your computer to actually load in um, the, the data file. It hasn't worked right, okay? If you're having trouble reading in the data file, Remember, I think we said last time, you can always do this. Import sys. Sys is just a 
set of system routines. It's a system library of things that help you um, understand what's going on with Python in your computer. It tells you where it's reading files from, things like that. Now I'm going to print sys.path. Sys.path is a predefined function that tells you where Python will look for files. So if you can't find the Python file you're looking for, the data file you're looking for, then try, print, try printing sys.path and seeing if that file is in there. Now to get any given cell to run, I simply click run with the cells highlighted. When I click run, any cell that's highlighted will execute. And you can see that this cell three, this cell five has run. And it tells me that on my Mac, these are, this is the search path. These are the directories which my computer will use to look for data files and other files as well. It'll look in the, the PyCharm project I was working on code from January 29th. Look in my Python 37, which is where I put the uh, Python uh, code when I downloaded it last fall. It will look in libraries. It will look on other things. So if you're having trouble reading in the data file and you're pretty sure the data file's on your computer, check your syspath and see where on your computer Python is looking for data files, libraries, modules, things like that. If the directory in which you have your file is not on here, you can do two things. One, you may want to move it to a different directory that is on this list. Two, you can always add a new, um, you can always add a new directory to the path. Um, I will simply say sys.path. I will dot insert. Sys.path, as you can see, is a list, right? It starts with a left square bracket. It ends with a right square bracket. It's got these long strings. They're separated by commas. Sys.path is just a list. So just like with any list, I can insert, I can append. If I append, it goes at the end. In this case, I'll insert zero into the first location in my list, I'll insert slash users slash Alfred Arsenal, which is my account name on my Mac, slash downloads. Okay, and that will add a new path to the directory and live demonstrations being what they will, I will probably get an interesting error on this one, but we will find out how this works. And again, to rerun that new one cell with the code, I simply click run. Uh, what did I do? Oh, I left out the uh, single quote. That's what I did. That's not a valid string. Okay. In theory, that is now valid Python. Ah, and how about that? We can see that I indeed did add the directory to my search path. And so that's one way of solving the problem is just inserting a new one. Now, I think we talked about this last week or a couple of weeks ago or whenever. This only works for this program. This will work every time I have this program, but this only works for this program if I have a different Python program in PyChart. If I have a different Jupyter notebook, if I want to change the path for everything, then I have to go in and change the system variable on my Mac or change the system variable on my Windows box. And if you have questions about how to do that, let me know because we'll have to walk through how that works. But this is one way to address the problem of uh, it can't find my data file. Well, here is how you put it in there. Okay. Um, now, following the rules of documentation, I should 
explain what's going on. So I will insert a cell above. I will tell Jupiter that this is a markdown cell. And in this markdown cell, I will say the following cell checks the current system path and adds the directory containing the data file to this path so that the data file can be found. Okay. And so that becomes just the markdown file. And when I click run, it just turns it in. You can see it. It's what Microsoft Word would call normal text. Um, and you can actually check out the font type and size, and you can change that if you wish uh, you, by fooling around with the um, various texts and options and things that you have here. So this is basically what you're going to do. Program heading, import the libraries you need, import other code you need if you need to figure out where exactly the file is, what have you, then you're going to read in your um, data file as a CSV. It will automatically read into a um, 2D list. So let me make sure that the data file is in my downloads directory. It looks like it is. I'm showing p3.p3 underscore data dot CSV in my downloads file. So, pandas, because that's the module I installed from, read underscore CSV, and it's called p3 underscore data dot CSV. And I'm going to store that in a variable that I'm going to call data list. Okay. Magician, nothing on my sleeve. Let's see how this one will fail in an interesting way on me. Okay. Interesting. File not found error, even though I put it explicitly in the thing. Okay. Let's try it this way, slash users, slash Alfred Arsenal, slash p3 data.csv. Let's run it again. Again, it didn't find the file. Okay, uh, let's see. All right, I will fool around with this later. This is, I know a number of you are having the same problem. I will. I don't want to spend all 75 minutes today on this on project three, but this is basically what you're going to do. So we'll talk more about Wednesday and I'll have this working by then and figure out exactly why you can't find that file. Um, but uh, we will we will make sure that works. It's P3. One real quick question. P3. Uh, P3 underscore data dot CSV is there in that directory. All right, we'll figure out why next time. Um, yes, go right ahead. Um, so I just I was just wondering how Jupyter saves to our computer because, um, I mean you told us to go to like file and save as, and even after I save it, I don't really know where to like find, um, I guess the notebook after I leave um, the tab. Okay, I, I apologize, Josephine. I didn't understand the full question. Can you try that again? I guess um, if I write something on like this notebook and I leave and I come back trying to write something else, like how would I miss, how would I find the um, saved notebook I already wrote on? Uh, anytime you start Jupyter Notebook, it will give you a list of everything it knows about on the computer. So in this case, you can see when I when I went to a terminal and started Jupyter Notebook. It told me that I have one called project 3.ipynb. So as long as you make sure you save it up here, file, save as, and you'll give it a name. And then the next time you start Jupyter Notebook from a, uh, a command 
teleprompter, a terminal on your computer, it should be there right at the top of the list on your uh, of the files it can find. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, we'll get back to that on Wednesday. Uh, again, I'll be on Slack several times a day working through that. Um, let me go back to the actual slides because before I want to spend the last 10 or 15 minutes talking about Lab 11 since that's due this week. Um, and, and the code is out on um, GL and I want to explain it to you and I'll also have one more chance to test it and make sure it works. What we're doing today and Wednesday, a little bit of each, is the computer science topic of analysis of algorithms, complexity, how long does it take things to run? This is a general field. The analysis of algorithms computer science class is 441 for the undergrads and 641 for the grads. And it's one of those bare courses you got to get through. This introduces the topic and, and talks about why it's important. We talked about two ways to search, binary and linear, through a list for a specific value. Linear search always works. It'll always either find the item or it will tell you it's not there. Binary search only works if the list is already pre-sorted for you, but it can be faster. And then we covered three algorithms for sorting a list, bubble selection and quick. And I'm gonna to talk to you today and give you some ideas in lab 11 you're gonna show uh, why quick sort is in general the fastest of those, uh, those algorithms and what does that mean? Linear search. I used some random number tools in Python and generated the following. Let me make this bigger because this is hideous to see. The following 120 element list. Okay, this is 120 random numbers generated between zero and 100 inclusive. You can see there's actually a zero and there's actually a 100, multiple 100s. Okay. How many times, I'm looking to see if 83 is in the list. Okay. How many comparisons do I have to do using linear search? Okay, that is, I'm going to look at an item and see if it's equal to 83. If it is, I'm done, I stop. If it's not, then I continue to move on to the next element. Okay. So in using a linear search, I'm going to start at the first element, 22. That's not 83. So then I'm going to check 75. That's not 83. Then I'm going to check 67. That's not 83. How many times, how many comparisons is it going to take me to see if the number 83 is in the list using the linear search algorithm? And the answer is, it's going to take me 120 because, and you'll have to take my word for it, 83 is not in this list. The random algorithm did not generate a single instance of 83 uh, out of its 120 different numbers. So if I'm searching this 120 element list for the number 83, I will have to check all 120 values and then I will find out it's not there. There is no 83. That's the worst case. The worst case of linear search is I will check every single element in the list. And either it's not found or it'll be found at the last one. Now, what if I'm not looking for 83? What if I'm looking for 22? How many times, how many comparisons do I have to make before I find whether 22 is in the list or not? And the answer is obviously one. Right, because linear search, I start with the first element. First element is 22. It's a match. I win. So in the worst case, linear search will take 120 comparisons. And in the best case, linear search will take exactly one. I can get lucky and find it on the first comparison. I mean, somebody wins the lottery, right? There is a possibility that you could find it. You could be so lucky you find it the first time. So in terms of analyzing the linear search algorithm, the worst case is I have to search everything in the list. The best case is I only have to search one thing. Now, the notation we use is called big O, okay? Big O because that's a capital O, and what it means is on the order of. Big O means on the order of. How long does it take for an algorithm to execute in its worst case? 
how many comparison, how many operations does it have to take? And generally, we assume a list of size n. On the previous slide, right, n was equal to 120. But in general, that list is of size n. So the notation, what I say is, in the worst case, linear search is O of n. Big O, parent n, is O of n or on the order of n. Because in the worst case, I have to check every element in the list, all n of them. It's a list of n numbers. I have to check every single one. Linear search is O of n. Now, if I, want, if I can talk about the worst case, I can also talk about the best case. The best case is denoted by the capital Greek letter omega. Omega of n is the best case. So big omega of n says how long does the algorithm take to run in the best case. Linear search is omega of 1 because like with 22 on the previous slide, found it the first time. So when I talk about how fast an algorithm linear search is, I say it's big O of n and omega of 1. That means in the best case, I only have to look at one thing. And in the worst case, I have to look at n. That's the notation we'll use today and Wednesday and on the final and throughout your computer science career to talk about how good an algorithm is. Big O, worst case, what's it going to do? Omega, best case, what's it going to do? Now, in binary search, again, it's best case omega, I might find it on the first time, right? If the list is sorted, I go to the middle value, I might just be looking for the middle value. I might find it the first time. But worst case, um, the worst case for binary search is log of base two of n. I will either find the item or I'll know it's not in the dictionary in no more than log base two in searches. Now, the nice thing is in my 120 element array, okay, two to the eighth power is um, 256, two to the seventh is 128. Okay, so I had 120, two to the seventh is 128. So the log base two of 120 is around seven. Let's just call it seven for good measure. Okay. So in the worst case, if, if that array was sorted, if that list that I used on this slide happened to have been already sorted, right, if this list was sorted, I would know whether 83 was in there in seven searches in the worst possible case. So that's a lot faster. So if the list is sorted, binary search is much faster because 120 elements, it's going to take me seven to find out if it's there or not. Linear, it's going to take me 120. That's the reason we do this analysis, because we try to find the best algorithm where best means fastest, cheapest, simplest, or maybe sometimes good enough. I understand it, and it's good enough. I can deal with this. And the way we quantify fastest, cheapest, good enough is O and omega. How fast, how many operations? Now, bubble sort, I have a list n elements long. Now remember what bubble sort works, and I'll show you a video on this in just a second. I start with a full list. I go through all of the elements. I compare each two. I compare 0 to 1, 1 to 2, 2 to 3. If there, if, if the zero is less, is great, if zero is bigger than one, I swap them. If one is bigger than two, I swap them. Now, so I have to go through all n elements the first time I go through. Now, after the first time through the list, the, I, can, I don't have to check the last list element, right? I only have to go through n minus one. So, the next time I have to go through n minus two elements. So if you look at this, you can see that I have number of comparisons I have to do is n plus n minus one plus n minus two 
plus n minus 3, and so on. Now, if you remember from your calculus classes, the sum from 1 to n of i, sum from i equals 1 to n of all the integers, happens to equal n times n minus 1 over 2. So if you want to say n times n minus 1 over 2, it's going to take you n squared minus n over 2 comparisons. Now, as n gets bigger, we just round this off, OK? Uh, we're going to show you in a second where n is. In the first example I'm going to show you, n is 100. The lab, n is 10,000, OK? 10,000 squared is 100 million. So 100 million minus 10,000, that's pretty darn close to 100 million. n squared minus n, as n gets really, really big, n squared minus n is pretty close to n squared. So what we'll tell you is that bubble sort is O of n squared. Now, best case, bubble sort is omega of n. It turns out if the list is already sorted, by coincidence, I'm given a list, told to sort it, it's already sorted. I stop, I can stop early. I only have to go through the list once. So let's see if I can find the right video. I apologize for the hideous sound of this. I think I'm gonna mute it. In this video, the numbers from one to 100 are randomly sorted. So we have 100 elements we're going to sort using the bubble sort. The biggest element is going to be bubbled through to the right each time. Now, in the top left of the screen, you'll see that this is keeping track, this program is keeping track of how many comparisons are made between elements during a bubble sort. Shockingly, this is exactly what you're going to have to do in lab 11. Okay, so we'll play this, and if the noise is too obnoxious, I'll mute it. <laughs> What's happening is the largest element is being bubbled to the right each time, and you can look up to the top of the screen, and you can see how many comparisons it takes to, to sort this list of the integers 1 to 100 as they're randomly sorted. See, we're getting very close to sorted now. And if you'll look up at the top, you'll see, ah, it didn't stay there. I should have stopped. Um, it took 4,950 comparisons. Okay. It was 4,950 comparisons to do a bubble sort. Now, I'm going to jump right to the selection sort video. And hint, selection sort is almost the same as bubble sort. It's different in a couple of ways I'll explain. Full screen and let's move this ridiculous sound. Again, you can see the comparisons that selection sort is making. It says array accesses, um, that's looking at various elements, and, and I'll explain that in a minute. It kind of, it'll, it'll be explained in lab 11. How am I doing on time? 4.42. Okay. Should have time to walk through lab 11 and, and let you all get some experience with this personally. Again, selection sort, what it's doing each time is it's going through the remaining unsorted list, finding the smallest value, and just swapping that one smallest value with the um, wherever that happened to be. I'm just making that one swap. Uh, now it's speeding up. And 
lo and behold, selection sort, just like um, bubble sort, took 4,950 comparisons. And if you look at it, 100, okay, this is the list of integers from 1 to 100. 100 squared is 10,000. 10,000 minus 100 is 99,900 9, divided by 2 is 4950. That's where that 4,950 uh, comparisons comes from. It's n squared, n is 100, n squared, 10,000 minus 100, 9,900 divided by 2, 4950. Now we're going to compare that with quick sort. Sort. Remember, we're randomly picking a pivot. We're flipping everything less than the pivot to the left and everything bigger than the pivot to the right. And then we're going to quick sort this part to the left and quick sort the part to the right. And you can see that we have different chunks of this list that are getting sorted all at once. And we're done. And if you'll notice, this took 843 comparisons, not 4,950, 843. Let's look at the details of the algorithms and explain why. Now, before I went to the videos, I explained to you, I said bubble sort is order of n squared. It takes n squared times n minus 1 over 2. And showed you that it took 4,950 comparisons. Uh, and then in the best case, if it was already sorted, and, and we'll explain that, and you stop when you don't swap anything, you only go through the list once, so it's omega of n. Okay. This just explains what I've already said. We rounded that off because when n gets really, really, really big honking number, say n is even a million, a million squared is a trillion. Uh, n squared minus n over two is, you know, kind of close to a trillion. It's okay. We just round it off. Again, O, big O means on the order of, on the order of this many operations. Now we showed selection sort. It's almost like bubble sort. You have a list n elements long. You have to go through all the remaining unsorted elements of the list each time. Okay, so the first time you have to go through all n elements. The second time you have to go through the remaining n minus one. Now you've picked the second smallest element, you have to go through n minus two. You pick the say, sec, third smallest element, you have to go through n minus three, and so on. So n plus n minus one plus n minus two plus n minus three. Apply your calculus class. You get n squared minus n over two. We round it off. It is big O of n squared. So selection sort is big O of n squared. However, its best case, big omega is also n squared because there's no way to short circuit it. There's no way to know ahead of time that you're already sorted and stop. So selection sort is in that sense worse than bubble sort in that it's O of n squared, same as bubble sort, it's omega of n squared. Now, one more notation convention, if O and omega are equal, we call that value theta. Theta of any algorithm, selection sort is theta of n squared, means selection sort is going to run in n squared time. It takes about n squared operations, and there's nothing you can do to make it better or worse. So that's our notation. Theta means that O, o and omega are equal. Now, quick sort is different, but it's probabilistic. I'm going to make an argument here. I just showed you an example on a video where, in a random case, quick sort was much, much better. And that's generally the case. Quick sort is much, much better. We pick a pivot. We pick it at random. In the code I'm going to give you in lab 11, I pick the first value. Um, I believe the video clip I showed, it picked the middle value, the, the one in the halfway through the list. I have no idea whether the pivot I picked is Somewhere in the middle of the list, lowest element in the list, the biggest element in the list. 
if I get really, really unlucky, I buy a lottery ticket that has none of the winning numbers. If I get really, really unlucky, every time I pick the pivot, it's the smallest number left. Works the same way with the largest, let's assume smallest. Every time I pick a pivot, it's the smallest number left. That means when I sort the rest of the values, all of them go to the right. All of them go bigger than the pivot. And I really don't do anything. All I do is make the list one element smaller. In the worst case, quicksort is on the order of n squared. So you would think quicksort's not better than the other algorithms because it's O of n squared in the worst case, just like the other algorithms. Um, the best case is omega of n. But something you'll learn as you go forward. For this class, quicksort is O of n squared. But realistically, when you look at all the probabilities, you run a Monte Carlo simulation, or you actually do the math and figure out the probabilities, do your statistics to this one, you're not going to randomly pick the worst value every time. You're not going to pick the best one, but you're not going to pick the worst one. Sometimes you're going to have some good luck. And in this case, Basically, this becomes like binary search. You split this up into two halves. So what you will often hear in computer science is that quick sort is order of n log n. Quick sort is on the order of n, the length of the list, times the log base 2 of n. Because probabilistically, that's what you're going to get. On the average, on the whole, with quick sort, you're going to get it takes about n log n comparisons and operations. For this class, for CompSci 201, just like we teach the majors, quicksort is order of n squared because you can conceive of a case where the worst possible case, you have the rottenest luck of anybody on the planet, it can take about n squared operations to sort using quicksort. It is possible. Unlikely, but it is possible. So for this class, quicksort is O of n squared. But in general, you'll find a lot of people who'll say, no, 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 quicksort is n log n, because that's average. Now, with that as a backdrop, I decided I, want you, I wanted you to play with this personally in Lab 11. So I am, I believe, log into GL. Yes, I am. In Lab 11, make this a little bit bigger. You will download a file from my um, public directory called sorting.py, S-O-R-T-I-N-G.py. This one, the Lab 11 instructions tell you how to copy that. So copy that and rename it Lab 11. The reason it's named sorting, not Lab 11 in my directory is because the Lab11.py file is the one that has all the answers. Didn't want to give you too much here. So you should be able to copy that directory, no problem, from my GL. Now let's look at it real quick. What I've done for you is given you a bunch of code. I've given you an iterative version of the bubble sort routine. Okay. We talked about this in class last Wednesday. I've given that to you. I've given you an iterative version of the selection sort routine. I've given you a recursive version of the quick sort routine because I said last week quick sort is much easier to understand recursive than iterative. Okay, so I've given you those three functions, an iterative version of bubble sort, an iterative version of selection sort, and a recursive version of quick sort. I have a main program that first generates a list of random numbers. Okay, this is what this is. This generate ordered the random number functions to generate a list of random numbers. Uh, it turns out that by default, I've set this up. It will generate 10,000 random numbers in between negative 100 and positive 100. Change the constants, you can change that. But for now, it's 10,000 random numbers between negative 100 and plus 100. Now, what I want to do, the code I've given you 
figures out how much time it takes to sort this array. You're gonna, and remember, you got to get a different time, number every time because it's a different set of random numbers. Um, Python includes some system variables, some system functions that deal with time. Okay, and so I can get the system time when I start a section of code. So right before I call bubble sort, I'm going to take the time. Right after bubble sort ends, I'm going to take the time. And so the time it took to execute the bubble sort routine is end minus start. So this code that I'm giving you tells you how long it takes to bubble sort the list. Now it takes, it, I also do the same thing, tell you how long it takes to selection sort the list. And I also tell you how long it takes to quick sort the list. Now, quick sort is going to be so fast that you might think I'm doing something. I, you might think I'm cheating. If you want, you can print out the 10,000 element list before it's sorted to make sure that it really is an unsorted list. And you can print out the 10,000 element list after it's sorted to make sure that it really is sorted. I've just commented out those print statements because, frankly, I don't want to see a 10,000 element list printed on my screen, but it really is there. So now this is called sorting.py, and the first thing you're going to do after you copy it is look at it to make sure how it works. And we'll get to that one in a minute. I'm just going to run this program, okay? So Python 3, sorting.py, this is running on GL. So generate a 10,000 element list of integers between negative 100 and positive 100, then bubble sort it. Selection sort it and quick sort it. If you look at this, it says it took 10 seconds to bubble sort it. It took 4.3 seconds to selection sort it. And it took 0 0.018 seconds to quick sort it. Quick sort, as I said, is so much faster that you have to stop and check yourself and go, did I really start with a random list and sort it properly? And the answer is yes, you did. Quick sort really is that much faster. Okay, that's what I give you. Okay, but I want you to instrument it. I don't want you to be satisfied with just the time. I want you to actually count comparisons. So, what happens is when I go back here in the bubble sort routine, if I do a comparison between one element of the list and the other element of the list, that's a comparison. I want you to count those. If I decide I have to swap two elements in the list, that's a swap. These three statements right here constitute a swap. So I want you to count the number of comparisons and the number of swaps in bubble sort. I want you to count the number of comparisons, like right here, and the number of swaps in selection sort, just using my code. You can make my code a little faster. You can optimize it. I didn't optimize it. You can make it a little faster, but don't just keep it this way. The point is the basics of the algorithm. Now, quick sort is a little harder because it's recursive. So I've given you a hint in the lab three assignment, how you're going to count um, comparisons. And you're not going to count swaps, you're going to count appends. So in quick sort, you're not going to count comparisons and swaps, you're going to count comparisons and appends. Now, what it should look like, let me go back to my other directory. Okay, let's see where I am. Ah, here's my lab11.py. What you should produce as your output for lab11 will look like something like this. Remember, it's doing the same thing. It's generating a brand new 10,000 element array list of integers, and it's sorting them 
Now, you'll look and see that, okay, this time it, it took a little longer. It took 12 and a half seconds to bubble sort, 5.8 seconds to selection sort, and only two one hundredths of a second to quick sort. But if you look at these other numbers that are printed out, you can see that bubble sort took 49,995,000 comparisons. Again, if you do the math, that's right, 10,000 elements. N squared times 10,000, that's 100 million, minus N minus 10,000 is 100 million, 990,000 divided by two. That's where you get your 49,995 from. I actually had to make 24,794,226 swaps. So bubble sort took 49.995 million comparisons and 24.794 million swaps. And that's why it took me 12 and a half seconds to bubble sort this sucker. Okay. Um, selection sort took 50 million, 50,000 comparisons, but it only took 10,000 swaps. And when you think about it, 10,000 swaps is about the right number because you're swapping once for each iteration. Each time through that list of 10,000, you're only swapping once, right? And so it makes sense that it only takes 5.8 seconds as opposed to 12.5 because the number of comparisons is in the ballpark 50 million 50 50 million 5000 versus 49 million 995000 that's pretty doggone close you can figure out the comparisons took about the same amount of time but 10000 swaps versus 24 million swaps almost 25 million swaps yeah it stands to reason selection sorts quicker because it has this fewer swaps by Comparison, no pun intended, quick sort only took two one hundredths of a second because it only took me, in this case, 79,000 comparisons, order of log n times n, and about 79,000 appends. Okay, so if I'm doing 79,000 comparisons and 79,000 appends, 0.02 seconds? Yeah, by comparison to what it took with selection sort and what it took with um, bubble sort to get those numbers. So that, in a nutshell, is what you'll be doing in homework 11. Okay, what you will be doing in homework 11, lab 11, sorry, which lab 11 can be found in the homeworks, et cetera, repo. Okay, let's just double check that it's there. Lab 11.pdf added it about three hours ago. Okay. Get the base code, copy that sorting.py file I told you. Name it lab 11.py because you have to hand in lab 11.py. So you got to rename it sometime. I told you the reason it's not lab 11.py in my files is lab 11.py is the file with the answers. Um, you can look at it. You can look at my code. Feel free to think of anything you want. Step two is where you have to add the code that counts these operations. Right? Don't just count. I've given you the code that counts the time. You have to add the code that counts the operations for bubble and selection, bubble sort and selection sport, sort. Let's try this in English or bubble sort and selection sort. Beginning of the routine, since these are iterative functions, you don't have to worry about recursion. You start with comparisons equal zero and swaps equal zero. Every time you make a comparison, you add a comparisons plus equal one. Every time you swap two list elements, you add a swaps plus equal one. And then immediately prior to the return, print out the number of comparisons and the number of swaps. So I don't bother returning comparisons and swaps to the main program. Um, I just print them out at the end of the routine. Remember, because these are iterative functions, you can do that. Start of the function, set comparisons and swaps to zero, accumulate them throughout the run of the function. At the end of the function, immediately prior to the return, just print out comparisons and print out swaps, and that will 
you know, explicitly lets you show how much these things are done. And it's okay, then you just return the sorted list. Okay. Now, quick sort, excuse me, because quick sort is recursive, you can't just do this because otherwise comparisons and swaps will be reset every time. You're going to actually have to track the number of comparisons and the number of appends you make in the function, and you're going to have to return them. And you're going, Arsenal, you idiot, we can only return one value and we have to return the sorted list. Yes, but you can fudge that. What you're going to have to return in each time through, in each recursive call of this uh, code, of, the, of this recursive quick sort, is you're going to return the number of comparisons you made, the number of appends you made, and the sorted list. So now those things are all going to be returned as a single list value I call result. Result is a list for three elements. The first element, result sub zero, is just the sorted list you got from this function. The other two elements, result one and result two, are the number of comparisons you made and the number of appends you made. Then you return that list result, and that lets you accumulate the number of comparisons and accumulate the number of appends, and that's how you get that total. Okay. Now, again, remember, every time you're, because there's an element of randomness, every time you're running this, you're getting a slightly different answer. So that's okay but your answers should be more or less on the order of what I got. Okay, your, 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 or your comparisons for bubble sort and selection sort, your swaps for bubble sort and selection sort, those should be more or less what I got. Uh, quick sort, because it's random and because I picked the first element as the pivot, et cetera, et cetera, uh, you should be in that ballpark, okay? You should be in the ballpark of that, but you know you you may be off by a few thousand. That's okay because it's just the way it worked randomly. If I ran my code again, I get slightly different answers. Submit the code. That's part, step two. Step three is this whole thing I've been talking about with bubble sort. We can stop early if the code if the list is already in order. Bubble sort is unique in that if the list is already in the right order, we can stop sorting early. So I give you an example in the home in the lab handout. I just happen to start by trying to bubble sort the array five one two three four. The list is five one two three four, and I want to bubble sort that. Well, when I follow the bubble sort algorithm, I try the five and the one, and I move the five over. I try the five and the two, I bubble the five over. I try the five and the three, I bubble the five over. I try the five and the four, I bubble the five over. So one time through the list, and you'll now see if you apply bubble sort to five, one, two, three, four, you get one, two, three, four, five. Now this is actually sorted. We do not actually have to run bubble sort again. Now we actually have to run it one more time to confirm this is sorted. But if I run it through, I don't worry about the five. I know the five's in the right place. I run bubble sort. One against two, I do not swap. Two against three, I do not swap. Three against four, I do not swap. If I have run through the entire list and I have not swapped anything, then I can stop, okay? So if I have run through with bubble sort and I have not swapped any values, then I can stop because I know my list is now correctly fully sorted. I don't have to do any more comparisons. I don't have to do any more swaps. I'm done. So that's what you're going to do in step three. You're going to write a new function. Don't mess with the existing bubble sort function, please. Write a new function optimize bubble sort and implement this optimization that we've just talked about, where if 
there were no swaps. You ran through the list and there were no swaps. You can stop. Implement that. The hint is that outer loop is not going to be a four. It's going to be a while. You're going to be a while on while you haven't gone through the entire list and while there was a swap in the last iteration, then you're going to go through. Either of those is false. We've gone through the entire list or there were no swaps in the last iteration, then we'll stop. So do this again. In, in other words, write the optimized bubble sort, generate an array of random numbers, use optimized bubble sort, use bubble sort, and talk about the differences you get in the number of comparisons and the number of swaps. and see what kind of results you get. Now, the hint I give you when you're writing optimized bubble sort is if you look at my main program, okay, let's go back to the main program and let's go back to If you look at my main program, you'll note that lists are mutable. If I just bubble sorted the list the first time, here, now when I call selection sort, it's already sorted. When I call quick sort, it's already sorted. I don't want to do that. I want to use the same unsorted list I want to use the same unsorted list with each algorithm so I get a fair experiment. I get a fair comparison among them and I decide which one is faster. You're going to have to do the same thing. When you run optimized bubble sort, remember that lists are mutable. So if you take the exact same list for bubble sort and run optimized bubble sort on the thing that bubble sort is already sorted, you're going to get a really bogus experiment and really bad results. So what you need to do is make a deep copy of the list that you generated. You generated the list up above, make a deep copy and sort the deep copy. That way you do not accidentally torpedo your own experiment by giving the second routine a list that the first routine has already sorted. So that's the call out there. In the form, this note about remember mutability says make sure you make a deep copy and sort the copy of the list and go from there. And we are essentially out of time, but I will be happy to answer any questions on the lab or the project. And again, Wednesday, I intend to spend the first, however much it takes in the class, talking in more detail about the project and the homework as well, since it's not until Thursday night. And then we'll get back to more of this complexity and analysis theory. So any questions? I have a question on the project. Sure. Um, so when I like try to import it, it says PD not defined or pandas not defined. Okay, you have to remember you have to install pandas as well. So you need to have. I installed it like twice, and like it's it's like does the um requirement satisfy thing? Okay, so the my guess is that it's not finding it. So you have to find out, check what directory it's in, and make sure that directory is on that path. So that would be, I, I mean, there, there are some other problems that it possibly could be, but my guess is that pandas is not, is in a directory that's not on this uh, uh, system path right here. Okay, I see. Thank you. All right, let me know if, if that doesn't solve the problem, let me know. All right, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Okay, great. I will talk to you on Wednesday and I will be on Slack or email or whatever in the meantime. Have a good evening. Professor, sorry. Sure, go right ahead. Um